What if there was more? More to the picture of your life. More to the story than what you can see. Than what you could even believe right now. More dreams realized. Potential fulfilled. Promises kept. More experiencing the joy of making a difference. And living life to the fullest. What if the end of your rope is actually the beginning of something amazing? What if there really is a God who can do infinitely more? Like he promised. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. And I want to say a big happy anniversary to every single one of you. You look great today. Amen. Why don't you look at your neighbor and just go ahead and say this. Say, smile because God is. Would you go ahead and say that? Just say, smile because God is. He sees so many great things he's thinking about doing in your heart and for you and through you. And I'm looking forward to starting this series because it's really going to teach us how to live in the joy of the Lord in a way that I promise you has not only changed circumstances in my life, but it's changed the overall trajectory of my life. And God promises to do that for every single one of us. I want to first of all just thank you for the privilege of being your pastor. You know, what makes this place special to me is the heart of the people. And it's really been that way from day one. I think of how you guys believed in my potential when I was a young pastor and my potential was developing. I'll never forget the service whenever I meant to say, give God a hand clap. But I said, give the devil a hand clap. I don't know if you know that can be embarrassing. I was going to get to the devil a little later in that message. <laughs> and and uh, doing many services can turn your brain into mush when you're a pastor. And I just kind of messed up. And you know what? It's okay to mess up at Faith Family Church because how many of you know we're not here to see through people? Come on. We're here to see people through, aren't we? And I love that about this church. And, and then I can tell you that the dare that you live with in your heart and the discipline that you live with, and the perseverance that you live with, are things that I cherish in my heart as your pastor. Because I know that great dreams aren't just fulfilled. Great families aren't just built. But what happens is there are some people who have what it takes inside, not just to fantasize, but to fellowship with the Father, and to bring forth the things that are in His heart. So I just want to thank you for that. Of all the things you can do to bless and love your pastor, he does like fajitas. And he likes tamales at Christmas, if you didn't know that. He likes those things. But those aren't anything compared to people who treasure the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because your pastor knows ultimately that's what he is going to answer to God for. And to be the kind of church that you are that has done that season after season after season. And now I look out and I look at our next generation in our church. And the Bible gives us incredibly wonderful promises about what happens when the generations serve God together. And how many of you believe this is going to be the best season we've had? Amen. We're going to go into some beautiful things that God has uh, in his heart. Well, today's study that we're going to be in the next six weeks is really going to help us experience uh, a future for you. You may be a new believer today, and it's going to teach you how to have the kind of future I'm talking about. So let's pray and prepare to get into God's word. Father, we thank you so much for how good you are. And Lord, we pray that you'll flood our hearts with insight so we can live in the things that you're longing for because of your great love for every single one of us. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said. A reputable source says that there are 215 million Christians who either live in a place that has high, very high, or else severe persecution. And when a believer lives in a land like that, it's very difficult because you can't even have the scripture to keep you, you know, strong every single day because the government doesn't want the scripture to speak to your soul. And so they keep it away from your country. They don't want, you know, the scripture to, to challenge how they live or challenge how they govern. And the believers have to come together and they have to try to experience God and live for God, even though they don't have the Bible like we have the Bible to guide us. And uh, I want you to picture this morning that you and I are living in one of those kind of lands. And here's why, because I want us to look into a book that is so good at helping a believer 
ever to experience the presence of God that if it was the only book in the Bible, you could learn how to have a powerful walk with God from just one book. We're going to be studying the book of Ephesians for the next six weeks. And let me tell you what's unique about the book of Ephesians. Every other epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote is what's called a contextual epistle. And what that means is it was written to a certain person about certain things that were going on in either their life or the church. So the book of Timothy was obviously written to Timothy about the things that were going on in his life. To the Philippians, Paul spoke with them about negative attitudes and how negative attitudes were going to keep them from the unity with God and each other that would bring forth his best in that church. And then you get to Corinth and the, the Corinthian epistles are doozies because you got people who are getting drunk before they go to their connect group to take communion. And there's a lot of perverse you know, stuff going on because Corinth, Corinth was the sin city of its day. And I'm glad for all the contextual epistles because there are times when the thoughts that God wants to share with us are rooted in what was going on in, in that person's life or in that church's life. But I love this, what's called a circular epistle because it was supposed to be circulated to every church and the pastor was to teach people how to truly experience God. As a matter of fact, listen to this introduction to Ephesians that was written by a scholar. It says, what you're about to read is meant to be taught to every church. It's the constitution of our faith and the great summary description of all that's precious and esteemed in Christian doctrine and Christian living. So whenever we study this, it should cause our relationship with God to be more precious to us, to be more esteemed by us. The book of Ephesians is the cure to worship without awe, to prayer without faith, to activity without God's anointing, and to belief that doesn't really bring forth the blessing that God's dreaming of bringing forth into people's lives. And the goal of the book of Ephesians is made really clear in Ephesians 3 verse 20, where Paul writes, now all glory to God who's able through his mighty power that's at work within us to do infinitely more than all we might ask or all that we might think. And so this book is able to bring us into a relationship with God where he doesn't reward us according to what we're asking him to do, but he does better than what we're asking him to do. He doesn't do the things we wish God would do, but actually because God created our hearts and because he can discern the desires of our hearts even better than we can, it brings us into a relationship with God that causes God to do the more that your heart wishes for that you don't even understand. And, and wanting more is just something that's natural for us as human beings. This last week, Tamara and I went to Jeffrey and Eden's house and had a pleasurable evening of fellowship. But part of what made it so pleasurable was there were quesadillas that made you say hallelujah. Can you say amen? And as we were eating those quesadillas, I had two on my plate. And when no one was looking, I inconspicuously glanced over to see if there were more, right? And when it comes to our relationship with God, God wants us to open the Bible looking forward to more. He wants us to come to church looking forward to the more that God wants to do for us individually, as families, as a church family. And, and, and those who live in the more don't live because they have less battles than other believers, but they live because they learn to believe the way that Paul is going to teach us how to believe in this series. And, and, and listen, we shouldn't be shocked that we live in a day whenever there's a culture that many Christians have embraced, there's a culture that many churches have embraced, and it leaves us wanting more. Paul spoke about that in 2 Corinthians verse, in 2 Timothy verse 3, when he said, but I want you to mark this, there are going to be terrible times in the last days, and people are going to be lovers of themselves, and lovers of money, and boastful, proud, abusive, and then he said they're going to have a form of godliness, but it's going to lack the power that serving God should bring into our lives. And for some people, it's an intellectual form, that they know a lot about the Bible, and they know about prayer, and they know they should attend church, and they know they should do these things, but it's intellectual, it's not relational, and it leaves their heart wanting more. For other people, it's emotional, and they can work themselves into a frenzy over their faith. But the truth is, 
sometimes the frenzy is just making them emotional. It's not making them spiritual. Where they're experiencing the presence of God and the more that God is carrying on, on the inside of his heart for them. And so I want to read you one more scripture before we talk about the first chapter, which is going to teach us this morning how to be infinitely loved more. And this is another verse that describes what the book of Ephesians should produce within us. Paul said, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and high and long and deep the love of Christ truly is. So you notice that Paul uses the terminology of somebody who would be involved in agriculture. Psalms 1 says that God wants us to be like trees that are planted by rivers of living water and because of how the water affects the tree we began to bear fruit in every single season of our life and when you think about people they are really unique like trees aren't they every life brings forth a different unique fruit God may bless us the same in some ways but in other ways we're really a unique person with unique desires and everything that that tree needs to be blessed is created within the DNA of that tree but if the tree doesn't have the right sunlight or if the tree doesn't have the right soil or if the tree doesn't have the right kind of you know uh, nurture that, that that causes it to be cared for well by the farmer then the potential of that tree can't come forth and as human beings we can just look at nature and if God had just brought the sun a little bit closer than it was you know we couldn't live on this planet we would burn up. If the sun was a little bit further away than what it is, we couldn't live on this planet, but we would freeze. And when we look at creation, we know that there's a God, but for many of us, we don't know how to live as those trees where who God is, is speaking so deeply to who we are as people that we know that it's the influence of God that's changing our circumstances and changing the very trajectory of our lives. That's what Paul's going to help us with in the book of Ephesians. And in the first chapter, he's going to teach us how to be infinitely loved more. And the first thing he says is God wants you to be more loved personally. He says this in the first five verses, and I'm going to read verse five first, and I think you'll understand why I do that when we get to the end of the five verses. But it says, in love, God predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and in accordance with his will. So Paul starts the first five verses by saying, God doesn't save us because he has to. God doesn't save us because after all these poor pitiful people somebody needs to do something for them but our relationship with God should feel very much like an adoption I have a person I know who's given their life for adopted kids and they told me one time Jim you know there's three characteristics of great adoptions number one he said the adopting parents have love for the child the second thing that I look for if I'm going to put a, a child in a home is that they have faith that the future of this child can be pleasurable and then the third thing I look for is I look for a joy that's in their heart that it's an opportunity not an obligation to begin to influence this child in a way where dreams are going to come forth that both of them begin to celebrate and when God looks at our life he doesn't look at us as an obligation but he sees an opportunity to be our father and to bring forth things that could never come forth without his influence. And Paul starts by talking about how his own life experienced this, that he was an angry, angry person and he persecuted people and he had them killed and dragged off to prison. Paul was one of those people that would give you a piece of his mind whether you wanted one or not. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Somebody said somebody gave somebody so many pieces of their mind they didn't have much mind left. And I don't know about that, but I can tell you people give me enough pieces of their mind that I didn't care what pieces were left. I didn't want to hear anymore. And that's the kind of person that Paul was. But then this angry person encountered the love of God and he became an amazing apostle. And Paul starts 
by saying this. He said, I'm writing to you as Paul. And he said, I'm an apostle by the will of God. In other words, God wired me for what I'm doing. But you know what? I wasn't able to be it without the sunlight and without the soil and without the influence of God on the inside of my heart. Some of us are struggling today and we're struggling with circumstances and we're putting ourselves down because we can't deal with this circumstances as, as well as we wish we could deal with it. And what we really don't understand is that this could be the greatest opportunity for us to be loved by God that we've ever had in our entire lives. And you may never be able to deal with that circumstance within your own wisdom, but the Father will step in because He loves you. And your love for Him will grow deeper because of how He handles this difficult experience in your life. And I know I'm speaking to people today in a crowd this size who've been abused, you've made decisions that you know you regret but I want you to know all that is an opportunity for the father to step in and to begin to love you right where you are but here's the difficult thing about adoption you can have the perfect parent but the child has been through so much that that child has to learn how to deal with things on the inside of their heart for instance whenever you, you, you lose your parents or or maybe, you know, I've had friends, I have a friend who literally his dad tried to kill him. And, and when he was adopted later, he said, whenever someone would correct me, he said, I would always feel like I was no good. I would feel like, you know, I'm just a mistake and nothing's ever going to go right in my life. And so the adoptive parent has to infinitely love that person to help them see, I believe in your potential. And that's why I'm maturing you. I'd never want to make you feel like you are less than. And then sometimes there's a bitterness in a person's heart who's been through problematic uh, issues. And that bitterness makes them, you know, regret the past more than they believe for the things that can happen in the future. And God has to deal with that on the inside of a heart. Or sometimes whenever you're trying to raise an adopted child, every time there's conflict, they push people away. And they push them away because they've been betrayed in conflict. And they've been made to feel less than in conflict. And God wants us to know right off the bat that I want to love you personally. And it's not an obligation for me to love you, but it's an opportunity for me to love you and to bring forth something that's going to bring us mutual joy. The second thing God says is he wants to love us more powerfully. He says at the end that, listen, when you experience me, it should bring praise for the glorious grace that's freely given to you because of the one who loves you. And then Paul goes into seven terms in the next eight verses that show us what it really means to be loved powerfully. He starts by saying, you've received redemption through his blood. And what that means is in that day, often people would, you know, get in debt just like people get in debt today. But the way you would pay off your debt is often your child or somebody you loved would become a slave to somebody else to pay off the debt. And they were all familiar with parents or relatives who loved that person who would begin to save the day that they became a slave. And when they had the money, it was called redemption money. And that, that redemption money would free somebody from their difficulty. And it would provide them with opportunity to have an amazing life. And, and Paul says when Jesus shed his blood, his precious blood was your redemption money. That freed you from the difficulty that sin put you in. And now God's thinking about the opportunity that he wants to fulfill in your life. The next thing he says is you have forgiveness of sin. Think of this as if you owed so much money to somebody that you could never repay it and they just decided one day they were going to forgive your debt and they were going to say don't worry about it and that's the way God is with us. He doesn't even want us to think about our past. How many of you are glad God has buried your sins in the depths of the sea? He's separated as far as the east is from the west. Amen? And God uses that term because if you start going east and try to find west, what's going to happen? 
you're never going to get there, right? And God wants you to know concerning your sin, I don't even want it in your memory. I want you to think more about what I want to do in your future. Then he says he lavishes, lavishes upon us his grace with understanding. And what that means is God wants everything he knows, everything that he is, to be used to bless you because you are his son and you are his daughter. And it tells us something about answered prayer, and that is that answered prayer doesn't just fall out of heaven. Like when we pray for God to save somebody we love or to deliver somebody we love or to bless us in our work or to fix tension in a relationship, God lavishes his grace by bringing understanding about how to deal with the problem so that if we get enough of his wisdom, the problem ends up turning into what he promises. Can you say amen? And then he says that we are predestined, which means God planned beforehand to bless us on the other side of our battle. It says we're chosen. That means that God came and he adopted us, much like a parent would adopt a child because they want to bless that child. And then it says he puts hopes on the inside of our heart. And a hope is an expectation that you have about the future. You know, I've been so poor in my life, the poor people called me poor. Can you say amen? I remember in college when I would go and give plasma because my dad had a heart attack when I was just 15 and he had to save for my mom's retirement. He was a successful man, but he wasn't told that he might, he was told he might not even live a couple more years. So I had to go and I can tell you in that state, I was glad I was at a Christian university because I might have done some stupid things if somebody hadn't have taught me how to get a hold of the hope that God had in his heart for me. And I can tell you, even though I was just 19 years old when I went to that university, I knew way back then that the life I'm living today was the life that God planned for me. And you say, why? Because God will communicate his hopes to you. Now, I didn't tell anybody right away because they had enough to laugh about. Can you say amen? And to think I could get from where I was to where God's helped me to be today was laughable to me, let alone anybody else. But I think about the founding members of Faith Family Church, and we all owe them a debt that we can never repay. Because their first decade, when they came together, the church grew pretty quick, and a couple hundred people came, and they felt the presence of the Holy Spirit, and it was so exciting. And then it split. And it went down to 100 people. Then it grew back to 150 people. Then it split again and went to 125 people. And they were kind of like me at the bowling alley. Every time I hit the head pin and feel good, I end up with a split. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And that's what church was like because God was teaching people how to walk with him. And he was teaching people how to walk with each other. But you know what's so cool about those people to me? There was a time whenever they bought steel from a hangar in San Antonio, and they wanted to put up a gymnasium for the church. And the steel sat there so long because they didn't have the money to erect it that finally somebody called and said, listen, I, I don't mean to, to be forward, but that steel sat there so long. Do you want to sell it? And they said, no, we don't want to sell it. We want to erect it. God told us that he wants to build a great church in this place. And how many of you know when the Holy Spirit works on a hope in the heart, if you don't give up, God will give you something beautiful down the road because you keep letting the Holy Spirit work on that hope that's on the inside of your heart. And their lives will always be beautiful to me because of what I'm talking about. God had a plan. They got hold of his hope. And then Paul said, we're sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you've ever bought a piece of land or a house, you know they seal that document. And it says that that document now belongs to this person. And when you were saved, do you know what God did because he loves you so much? By the power of the Holy Spirit, he sealed your heart with the Holy Spirit. And he said, now they're mine, and I'm going to bless them if they'll just let me bless them. And, and Paul starts this amazing book by saying, if you think Christianity is a bunch of rules, and if you think being a Christian is going to be the most boring thing that you've ever done, you don't understand why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross because he wants you to be loved personally, 
He wants you to be loved powerfully. And then the third thing is God wants to love us through answered prayers. Paul writes in verse 15, he said, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all people, I haven't stopped giving thanks for you. And I remember you now in my prayers. Now, it's interesting to me that Paul didn't say he prayed for everybody. The truth is we do that, don't we? You will say, so, hey, I'll be praying for you. Hey, bro, I'll be praying for you. Hey, girlfriend, I'll be praying for you. And then if I had a confession of sin service about whether you prayed or not after you said those words, there would be people who needed forgiveness. Can I have a good amen? But Paul saw something in the hearts of these people that made him pray because he knew God could do something wonderful for them. And the first thing he saw was belief that was in their hearts. And listen, when you really decide to be a true believer, I want to pray for you because our Father is amazing. And if someone will really worship with awe, and if somebody will truly believe, and if they will pray with faith, and if they'll make a decision that church won't just be about activity, it'll be about how the anointing of God is working in my heart heart listen when that happens I want to pray because I love seeing what God does in a person's life who does that and Paul said because of how I see you relating to God and because of how I see you loving people I'm thanking God for you and I'm praying for you and then he went on to say this I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus the glorious father will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened that you may know the hope to which he's called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now you notice the two things that we can expect when we pray and the first is wisdom from God. That what's gone wrong with our life will change because of the way that God begins to work. The second thing that God brings us is revelation. God helps us see things that we wouldn't have seen about our life. And because we see things differently, we start taking different paths because we say, I may not understand everything, but I know who's talking to me right now, and I trust him to do something down the road that's going to be amazing. I'll never forget an experience I had when I was 28 years old that really marked my prayer life and marked my desire to follow God. I was asked to be the pastor of a church in Philadelphia. And the person who asked me was a graduate of the university I attended, and his father had built the largest remanufacturing business in the United States. The son had taken over the company, and he wanted to build a, his company where he could hire more people from our university. So he asked some people at ORU, and they said, you know, I think Jim Graff would be a good pastor for that church. So I flew up to meet Michael Cardone, uh, Jr., and I'll never forget him telling me the story of how this amazing company with thousands of employees was built. He said, my dad was an Italian immigrant. And he said he was driving down the road on a rainy day. And he said it was raining so hard his windshield wipers weren't working well. So he pulled over into a service station. And when he asked the price of some new windshield wipers, he was mad because he was an immigrant and didn't have much money. And he looked at the windshield wipers and he thought, how in the world can these things cost so much? And he started complaining to God. And then I like to say that God made him an offer that he can't refuse. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Because when I was in that interview, I felt like I was meeting a mob family. They were all a bunch of Italian folks. And, and the Holy Spirit started speaking to Michael Cardone Jr. And he had become a believer. And he knew it was the Holy Spirit talking to him. And the Holy Spirit said to him, I want you to build the company that he built. And he said, I want you to employ these, these, uh, these immigrants that, 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 that you're feeling for. I want you to make them employees. I want you to give them a good life. And so I remember standing in Michael Cardone Jr.'s office looking at thousands of people who were immigrants who were working on the plant. And he had chaplains who, who were paid to help them deal with their own personal problems. And it wasn't God's will for me to go. When I prayed about it, God told me, no, I have something else for you. You're not ready even to pastor this church right now. And how many of you know I'm glad for the something else that God had for me? I get to pastor incredible people like you this morning 
But I'm telling you, it marked me. I didn't want to miss the thoughts that the Holy Spirit had for my life because it, it just strengthened in me. Listen, this is real, folks. It's not like what I read last night when I was going over my message for the last time and something came on TV and it told me that in 20 minutes it could help erase all my wrinkles it could help me restore my memory. And then when they said it would blast my belly fat, I thought if that was real, it would be known about all over the world. Can somebody say amen? What I'm talking about this morning isn't like that. It's real. That God wants to love you powerfully. He wants to love you personally. He wants to answer your prayers. And here's the final thing that Paul closes this amazing chapter with. He says God wants to love you onto a better platform than what you're on right now. He closes by saying his incomparably great power for us is for us who believe. And that power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. In other words, Paul is communicating that what God wants to do is he wants to lift you above what the enemy has done to you. That just as Jesus was in the grave, and only through God's power could he be raised to the platform that he's on today. So God says, when I look at every single one of my children, what I want to do is I want to love them, and I want to lift them above everything that they've ever been through, and I want to see them on a platform that shows how wonderful they are, what an amazing creation I made them, how awesome their life can be. Nothing gives me more pleasure as their father than to bless them until they're lifted up on a platform that's just like that. Now, if you're just a human being today that's normal, you don't want to miss out on that. And that's the way we should feel when we read our Bibles, when we come to church, when we pray. We should be looking forward to the infinitely more that God has in store for us as people. You say, Jim, what keeps us from that? Well, I want to share another story with you that I think illustrates very well what keeps us from that. And it's about a man named Leslie Newbigin. And he was an ordained pastor in the Church of Scotland Gave his life to the Lord when he was 19 years old. And uh, then he went on to college and he went on to seminary, met his sweetheart, got married when he was 26 years old, went to India as a missionary. And after a decade, he became the bishop of the work in India. And he went to heaven about the same time my father-in-law did. And both of them did so much for the nation of India. But he wrote about how when he was a young man, he wanted to do so much for God and he loved God so much that one day he got an idea. And he was kind of a dramatic fella uh, in personality. So he decided he was going to take a sheet of paper and he was going to write on this sheet of paper what he was going to, to do for God. And he started with the things that he wanted to be. And he said, God, I'm going to be holy I'm going to be a person who doesn't cuss anymore. He was still a young Christian. I'm going to be a person who, you know, doesn't do this and doesn't do this. And God, I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that. And uh, he said he took it to the communion table in their sanctuary. And he said he curtsied, which I don't know how to do it. I tried in the first service and, and, and Tamara laughed at me. Now she's laughing again like this, maybe. I don't know. But he curtsied. And he said these words, this king I resolved to do for you. And he said when he did it, it was like the Holy Spirit in him was going, Ooh. and he knew God enough to know that he didn't impress God with all these things he told God he was going to be for him. So he took the paper out and he wrote some more things. He said, Lord, I'm going to serve the poor. I'm going to be a missionary for you. And he took it again and he curtsied. Come on, give me a hand clap. That was a better one. I'm going to get this down before the end of the morning. And he curtsied and he said, this is my king. I resolved to do for you. And he said, in my heart, I could tell the Holy Spirit was like, uh-uh. Kind of like Tamara was when I bought the wrong flowers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And she helped me learn what the right kind of flowers were to bless her. And that's what happened when he finally came up the third time. He crinkled the paper, he threw it in the trash basket, 
And this time he came before the Lord and he said, this, my king, I resolve to do for you. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll be whatever you ask of me. How many of you know when we do whatever he asks, life becomes way more awesome than we ever dreamed that life can be? Amen? Let's pray this morning. And if you're comfortable, whatever you're most comfortable do, if you're comfortable lifting your hands before the Lord, that's good. If, if you want to bow your head, whatever it is that will help you say to God, God, I don't want control anymore. I love the scripture that says that God wants people to worship in church. And he talks about worshiping with uplifted hands, but again, a bowed head is the same, whatever somebody feels in their heart. But God said, I want you to worship me without wrath. I want you to worship me without doubting. And whatever you're angry about this morning, I want to encourage you to put that at the feet of the Lord. Because I promise you, like Paul, he'll take you from angry to amazing through the way he'll work in your heart as you read your Bible, as you come to church, as you make up your mind to experience him. What is it where you could easily doubt? You could easily get bitter because somebody did something to you. And your king is saying, will you forget about what's been done to you? And will you start trusting me to do something for you that will cause you to praise my glorious grace for the way that it's working in your life? Father, we pray for that this morning. God, we pray that your grace, God, will cause us to see your goodness in every single individual life. God, in families, God, we thank you. Your grace is going to put praise in our heart these next six weeks as we learn how to walk with you. Father, in our church family, we thank you that this will be a season characterized, not by activity, Lord, even though we'll do much for you, but God, let it be a season characterized by your anointing. And Lord, the things that you have in your heart to bring forth. Lord, we thank you for adopting us. We thank you for being such an amazing father. And we praise you today in advance, Lord, for all the goodness you have in your heart for us. All the good things we know we're going to see in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Hey, if you love his word, would you give him a hand clap this morning? And I just want to do one more thing before Pastor Larry comes. I want to pray one more prayer. So if you'd bow your heads with me just one more time, I want to pray for those who are here today. And uh, in your heart, you know you need to give your heart to God. And let me tell you how you can know if you need to give your heart for God. If there's something inside of you today that's saying, you know what? I'm not as loved by God as I want to be loved. I'm not as led by God. I don't have God doing the good things in my life that I wish God was doing in my life. If that's the, the state that you're in today, it's why the Bible says this. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Somebody said to me as a young Christian, if he's not Lord of all, or if he's not the Lord in a way, Jim, that you see him making a difference, he's probably not Lord at all in your life. And you have to come back to that place where you say, God, I want your way, not my way. And so I'm going to say no to sin. I'm going to say yes to you. I'm going to believe that you'll be more good to me than I would even be to myself, Lord. I am going to let you sit on the throne of my heart and have your way. If you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor Jim, that's exactly what I need. I want to be infinitely loved by God. I want God to love me, to lead me, to bless me. Would you pray for me? If that's you, I want, to, I want to pray for you at your seat. Just shoot your hand up in the air and wave it at me. Did you do that? All over. I'm going to look at every section. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Awesome. Over here, God bless you. Anybody else? You say, today, I'm ready for God to love me. I love the scripture that says he stands at our heart's door and he knocks. And you know this morning if he's knocking at your heart's door. And if you know it's time to open up that door and to let God love you, just lift your hand. We're going to pray for you all over this place. Amen. Amen. Okay, one final invitation. Maybe you say, Jim, man, I, I gave my heart to God, but I, I kind of strayed away. And today I, need, I know I need to come back to him. If that's you, would you lift your hand too all over this place? If you strayed right over here, awesome, 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 wonderful. 
Awesome. In the upper risers. Make sure up there somebody see her hand. Okay, well, church family, you can look up. And can we give all the many hands that were lifted a great big hand this morning? Amen. Let's celebrate with them. And if you'll put your hand on your heart, and the church is going to pray this with you, let's say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know we're all sinners. That's why God sent you to save us, to forgive us, to heal us, to bless us. And Lord, today, I say no to sin. I say no to self, being in charge of my life, and I say yes to you. Thank you, Lord, for caring enough to come. I look forward now to a new beginning and great blessing through you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, uh, we care about your new beginning turning into the, the blessings that God wants to bring into your life and also the blessings God wants to bring through your life into the lives of other people. So that's why we prepared this packet. In this packet, there's first of all a book. It's titled 30 Days to a New Beginning, and uh, it addresses the subjects that are vital that, that you're dealing with it in your heart as you're getting off to a new start. So we want to give it to you free of charge. It's just two minutes in the morning. It's just a devotional. But a lot of people found it to be a great help. We also have a card in this packet. It helps you learn to study the Bible. And if you have teenagers, it helps your family learn to study the Bible. And th then there's a card where you can let us know how we can help you begin to start your walk with God. But can we give them one more hand clap, Faith Family? We're so glad you're here today. Amen. All right, there I am. Okay. All right, everybody good this morning? Wasn't that good? I know you got some, a lot of good things out of that. Let me read you one of my favorite giving scriptures uh, from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, where it says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. What I love in that text is this, God is able. God is able to make all grace abound to you. And how many would love to have the grace of God on your life? To love to have the grace of God, his anointing that just uh, pervades your life. And uh, some of what Pastor Jim's talking about, understanding the love of God. But God is able, listen, if God gave you a vision, you need his grace. If God gave you a family to raise, you definitely need his grace to raise those young ones to serve the Lord. Amen? And so we need God's grace upon us so that, so that we can do every good work that he's called us to. I believe there's a special grace on Faith Family Church, the, the staff and the leaders, to accomplish the vision that God's called us to. There's a grace upon it to, to win the lost, to, to, to evangelize to disciple people and to care about them. There's a special grace to do that. And that grace is on you. And the reason we do that is because you're such wonderful people that serve God with such passion and you serve him with his grace upon your life. And the thing is I thought about as I was thinking about us taking the offering today is I just thought about the fact that it's so good to plant a seed every week consistently because there's a principle that I completely believe in, and that's consistent living and consistent giving allows grace to be on my life. And uh, I've, I've learned that from Pastor Jim, listened to him for many years, that, that if we'll just live a consistent life, not one that's up and down and not one that's all over the place, but one that's consistent, and if we'll live consistent, give consistent, then God's grace is going to be upon our life. And we're going to get to do all the things that he's called us to. And I want to encourage us today on Anniversary Sunday, let's plant a seed for the next generation that they're going to build upon the legacy that we're going to leave to them so that they'll make this church even a greater place than we've made it over these 30 years. Amen? Well, ushers are going to uh, wait on us this morning. Thank you so much for your giving. And uh, I know God's going to bless you as you give today.
All right, let's pray a prayer of blessing over our tithes and offerings this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the chance that we have, God, to give to your work. And as we give of our tithes and offerings, thank you for the work you're doing in us as we put you first. Thank you for what you're doing in our community all the way around the world through our tithes and offerings. We just pray a blessing over these tithes and offerings, God, that they go a long way for your work and a blessing over the givers. We give cheerfully in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. How many of you guys think this is going to be a good series? Wasn't that a great message? Thank you, Pastor Jim. So good. And happy 31st anniversary, guys. That's a long time. I'm so, so thankful to be part of this place. I want to just take a look around. I got to be honest. I thought I'm proud of you guys because I know this, the Cowboys play at 12, right? And you guys are still sitting in your seats. I think they might win today and we know why. So I'm going to give you credit for that. Uh, don't leave now. We're, we're about to dismiss. Hey, I want to let you know on your way out, we have these, uh, these annual reports. We like to do these uh, every year. This uh, gives us an idea of everything that our giving and volunteerism has gone towards this past calendar year. It talks about over 2,000 people, decisions that have been made for Christ, rededications and salvations. That's here. That's in our next-gen ministries, our children, our jail ministries. God's doing awesome things. So I just want to say thank you. It, says, it tells us some stuff about what's going on in India. So to all of our volunteers, thank you guys. To our leaders, thank you guys. To all of you who give week in and week out, who gave through our legacy campaign, thank you. This does not happen without you. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be a part of a place. We don't just come to church, but we see God making a difference through us. So thank you guys. Love you. Happy anniversary. Make sure you grab one of those and you can see that on your way out. Uh, prayer team, I want to dismiss you guys to the Connection Center. If you came wanting prayer today, we are going to be having that in the Connection Center. You can make your way back there. We'd love to pray with you. Can I pray a prayer of blessing over you before we go? Let's do it. And ushers are going to dismiss us by section after I pray here. This is for you online as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Ushers, come do your thing. You guys have a great day, and we'll see you later.